Good morning. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Thank you all so much for being in the Zoom room with us this morning. I'm Ryan Dennis, Chief Curator and Artistic Director of CAPE at the Mississippi Museum of Art. And I'm so delighted to be here um, to introduce our uh, Mississippi Invitational Artist and Curator Conversation. Um, for those that don't know, the Mississippi Invitational is a biennial exhibition. Uh, is a survey of recent works created by contemporary visual artists living and working in the state. Um, artists across Mississippi are invited to submit for consideration. And this year, um, works were selected by my dear friend and a brilliant curator, Houston-based guest curator, Danielle Burns Wilson. Um, this year, we are so excited to have our largest exhibition since its inception. So we have 42 artists from across the state represented, which I just wanna say, woohoo, raise the roof on that. Um, these are um, really important exhibitions because you know, it really does allow for us to see what's happening within the region, within the region and um, within the state. And it really allows for us to learn what's happening from an artist's point of view um, in a pretty hyper-local way. So I'm excited to hear what, um, Brendan and Coulter and Lawson have to share with us this, um, this morning. Um, I, I also just want to say congratulations to all the artists who are in the Zoom room with us this morning. And um, I really hope that you all had a, a beautiful evening last night. And we really look forward to finding ways to celebrate again um, <clears throat> before the exhibition closes on uh, November 4th. Seventh. <laughs> Seventh, sorry. Um, the, the Mississippi Invitational um, Exhibition, the catalog, and the fellowship are made possible with support from the Community Foundation for Mississippi, the Jane um, Crater Hyatt Fund. Um, so a few thank yous before I turn it over to Danielle. Big thank you to Ross and Jurger. Um, to all the folks in the in the Zoom room with us, we have a Q and A and a chat feature. Which um, please ask questions um, throughout the conversation, um, and we will open it up for Q and A at the end of the program. Um, if there is any kind of technical difficulty, we will pause briefly. It's now raining here in Mississippi, and sometimes that well, at least it's raining here in Jackson and. Um, in the Fondra neighborhood, and sometimes that kicks out uh, the internet. But if anything were to happen, um, we will pause briefly and then come back up. And hopefully, fingers crossed, um, nothing will. And of course, this conversation is being recorded. So our panelists, our three wonderful artists featured in the exhibition, um, are Jane um, Hyatt uh, Fellowship winner, Coulter Fussell. Congratulations. Uh, Lawson King and Brendan Davis. I will turn it over to Danielle to introduce the artist, but before I do, I just want to introduce Danielle formally, um, again, the guest curator of this exhibition. So Danielle Burns Wilson has almost two decades of experience as an art professional. She is currently the curator and art director at Project Row Houses in Houston's Third Ward, Texas. Um, Wilson is also the adjunct professor at Lone Star College, North Harris campus. She received her BA in, in history and political science from Prairie View and m University and her MA in art history from the City University of New York, Brooklyn College. Um, Danielle began in 2001 as development coordinator at the University Museum at Texas Southern University. She also worked at the Allen Shepard Gallery in New York City and St. Louis Art Museum where she was a distinguished St. Louis art Museum Romere Bearden Fellow 2008-2009. Other fellowships include the Mickey Leland International Enhancement Fellow where she studied contemporary East African art at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. From 2010 to 2013, Danielle served as a curator um, at Houston Museum of African American um, Culture, which we call HMAC in H-Town. Um, and then for over a decade, she served as a chief curator at the Houston Public Library and manager of the African-American Library at the Gregory School. 
During her tenure, Wilson organized The Whole World Was Watching, Civil Rights Era photographs from the Edmund Carpenter and Adelaide de Manil with the Michelle White at the Manil Collection. And in 2011, she was the guest curator or curate NYC. In 2016, she organized the popular exhibition Sunday Go to Meeting, African American Women and Church Hats in Houston. In 2018, she opened Chasing Perfection, the work and life of architect John S. Chase. Um, the show recently traveled to the University of Texas of Architecture. I'm sorry, the University of Texas School of Architecture. Um, <clears throat> Danielle received uh, the Distinguished Pace Setters Award in 2014 from the Association of African American Museums, supported by the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington. So you are quite distinguished, my dear. And we are so, again, excited to have you on this journey with us. Um, and we really do look forward to having you in Jackson at some point here soon. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, um, artists, for being here bright and early with us on a Saturday morning. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you for uh inviting me to guest curate this invitational. It's truly been a pleasure to work on this exhibition. You know, I think the world of you and I'm excited to see what you do in Jackson, um, all of the upcoming exhibitions and programs uh, you're working on. They are lucky to have your curatorial vision and leadership. Um, I just wanna thank the Mississippi Museum of Art team Director, Director Betsy Bradley, Mackenzie Drake for being so swift and flexible with um, this Zoom forum, uh, the educational team. I wanna really thank Christina McField who organized all the studio visit Zoom calls. And more importantly, um, thank you for sitting through all those studio visit Zoom calls. Also a special thanks to Robin Dietrich. Um, she's so familiar with the exhibition space. So working on the layout from uh, virtually has been painless and amazing. And then I also wanna recognize all the artists that I've met along this journey and congratulate the 42 artists selected. I couldn't be more happy for you. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation early Saturday morning with these three participating artists, Brandon Davis, Culture Fossil, and Lawson King. Um, just to briefly introduce them, Brendan Davis is a freelance illustrator, painter, and animator born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. He gradu graduated from Millsap College in 2020 with a BA in studio art and digital design. When he's not at his job at Fondren Art Gallery, Davis is hard at work in the studio painting on cardboard and creating animated shorts. He's dedicated to making works of art on equal parts meaning and making them meaningful, thoughtful, and engaging. Coulter Fossil was born and raised in Columbus, Georgia, in, in textile, oh, an old textile town. Uh, she is the youngest family quilter hailing from multi-generationals of generations of seamstresses and quilters. Fossil produces boundary pushing quilt works using old discarded and donated textiles from her soul materials. And we're gonna talk about that a little later. Um, top, to quilt by her mother, she relies on the painterly qualities inherent in used textiles to bring depth, character, and story to her quilt. Um, walking a compositional balance, she uses the socialized, standardized, and purposeful restraints of quilt patterning, patterning to self-edit that would otherwise be full of total leap into expressionistic abstraction, playing with hyper-personal stories as wild melody and tandem with the harmony and broad themes of risk and freedom. Coulter has exhibited across the country from San Francisco Museum of Modern Art to the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art in Charleston, South Carolina. She is the finalist for the 2017 South Art Southern Prize, the 2019 Visual Artist Inductee of the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters, and the 2019 United States Artist Fellow in Craft. Coulter lives in Water Valley, Mississippi with her family and as Ryan mentioned earlier, the Height uh, Award winner. Lawson King is an artist from Indiola, Mississippi. He works primarily in sculpture, creating works for public places because art is for everyone. 
After earning a BFA at Delta State University, King went to the Midwest to work with sculptor Ray Kaz. In 2020, he received the Artist Fellowship from the Mississippi Arts Commission. King is currently in Clarksdale, Mississippi as a part of the Cahoma Collective, continuing creating and exhibiting public art. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So um, before we begin this discussion and we talk about your artwork and the themes of the show, I wanted to ask you all, I know you all have been to the show, just your thoughts um, for those of uh, our viewers that haven't been able to see the show. And I know it opens today to the public. So um, maybe Lawson, and it doesn't have to be anything too long, just wanted to get thoughts, especially because I can't be there with you. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, I thought it was great. I mean, I, I, I was really kind of surprised and uh, really pleased with the variety of work and the depth of the work. You know, I thought every every section, you know, how it was arranged was really, it was beautifully composed in the galleries. And I thought that like it really told the story, you know, of, of the themes of the show. So I, I, I really enjoyed it. What was like your favorite work? Oh my God, somebody asked me this yesterday. Um, it's really hard to say. I mean, uh, so Whitson, Whitson uh, Ramsey, he has a gorgeous painting um, based off of a Polaroid that I really love. And uh, Kristen Tordello Williams flags, I really love those. Um, and then how they kind of swayed in the gallery a little bit. Those were really nice. But I mean, you know, every piece was so good. You know, uh, Brendan, I really loved your work. Halter, your, your quilt looked amazing on the wall. But um, I, that's a hard question. <laughs> Every day it'll be a different answer. I like it. What about you, Coulter? Um, yeah, the show's great. Uh, one of the things I really liked about just the number of artists there, you know, when you, when you live in Mississippi, you feel like there's five artists here, you know, and that you know them all. You know, it can be a, like a lonely road to hoe to be a visual artist in Mississippi. And um, so to go to the museum and see so many artists and, many of which I had I didn't know yet you know and so to be exposed to new work that was from our state and have it be so you know so so much variety and so many it was uh, very encouraging and uh, I loved getting to see work by artists that uh, the, they were newly introduced to me so yeah what about you Brandon you know I, I think I feel I feel the same way as Coulter. Like if you asked me a few years ago, I would have thought that Mississippi was like an artistic wasteland because I was, I was a high schooler who did not, like I wasn't aware, it wasn't like shown to me, I had no idea. But when I got there and I saw all those artists from Mississippi in one place, I like I really I really felt that you know there was a lot of richness in our artistic culture, and that there was a lot of art that Mississippi has to offer, and I was really proud of that. Yeah, I mean I um, talk about it in my essay, but um, I'm from the South. I love the South. And I think that oftentimes even curators, although you're in your own space, you know the, the artist around you, but you don't, and you know, like, you know artists in a national scope, right? But you don't think about how to focus in on like one particular area. And I guess like this invitational was so amazing because I really got to see so many artists in Mississippi working in you know, several different mediums and just, I mean, amazing work. And I know this Invitational has been different for a myriad of reasons, as Ryan mentioned, I know, and you guys all mentioned like this is, and this is the first time in the almost 25 year history of the Invitational that so many artists have been featured. But I do think it does speak to the extreme amount of talent in, in the wonderful state of Mississippi and the great submissions that uh, we received. So when Ryan asked me to guest curate the show, nobody could have predicted the events that followed in 2020 from COVID-19 that we're still dealing with, um, 
a lockdown, and the public murder of George Floyd. And that's just to name a few. So because of all of these things, I knew my curatorial focus from, uh, to the Invitational was going to have to be different from my predecessors because it had to be, you know, um, and I felt remiss um, if this Invitational didn't reflect like the voices and experiences of this moment. So I think it's different in the vein that, you know, typically in an Invitational, you just uh, curators look at work, you select the best works, and then you put together a show from there. But I think I was more intentional about what I was looking for. Although I hadn't, you know, put it all together yet, it was really when the work started to inform me. So 2020 and now 2020, 2021 being tumultuous uh, years, but art has always been an integral part of really redirecting struggles toward and in showing progress. And it's my hope that this exhibition really does that. So um, before I talk to you guys a little bit more, I just wanted you to, to get a glimpse into my process for selecting this year's invita Invitational Art and Artist. So there were over 600 works of art that were submitted that I reviewed. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work. Um, and from there, I narrowed it down and since COVID, I couldn't travel to Mississippi for studio visits. So I had a lot of Zoom calls that I mentioned before. Shout out to Christina McField again. Um, and then from there, I narrowed it down even more to works and artists that I selected. So a few days after I concluded all the studio visits, I really reflected upon the art and the conversations I had. And I think for me, even as a curator, this process was so different. Um, I was at home with my four-year-old at the time and my husband. So a lot of you all met my son, you know, and um, I think it was easier to have conversations uh, with the artist and really humanize this whole process because we had to, you know, um, our professional lives and our personal lives just tend, they seem to merge. Um, and it was quite refreshing at first. I honestly don't know if I was looking forward to this process but it was such a refreshing process um, to go through. So, like I said, after a few days after the visits concluded, I reflected upon, you know, conversations and the art and really three themes emerged for me. And it was resilience, reckoning and reflection. So the first theme I wanna discuss is resilience. And in the exhibition um, for viewers, you're going to see a lot of references and really a lot of reverence to children um, quite a bit because I think they are the single most resilient things at this during this time and we can really learn a lot from them. So Lawson, um, you are a sculptor. We had some amazing conversations about your work and um, resilience in a lot of ways. So can you tell us a little bit about your work in the show? What has inspired you? What has informed your work? And um, I was really impressed with your works and really your use of balloons as symbols. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, I wanted to say too, what uh, Brendan and Coulter were saying at first about the uh, landscape of artists in Mississippi and how, you know, growing up here, I didn't know many. I mean, now I know more, but just to see the show, I mean, proves that there's resilience in these artists because even if you're not surrounded by, you know, a bunch of artists like people are in New York where they're super inspired and it's super competitive. Like here, you know, it's kind of like you're doing it for yourself and you're doing it like because you have to. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to speak on that first. Um, but yeah, so uh, my work, um, I make the body of work I'm doing right now is basically the imagery is hands and balloons. Um, and these were symbols that I had used in works previously, but they were never at the forefront of, of the work. And I started to kind of look at my old work and try to process like, you know, what I'm making and why I'm making it. Um, and I found these hands and balloons in a lot of my work. Um, and so I taught kids for a long time, uh, but even before I figured out I would be an artist, I, I taught art, kids art because I, I loved to, I loved art. I just didn't realize that I could do it because like, you know, I didn't know many artists. And so I, growing up in Indianola, you know, it was kind of unfeasible, you know, unfeasible to me. Um, 
but I started teaching kids and their freedom and their, you know, uh, individuality and their lack of uh, just, you know, their lack of learned protocols, I guess, of how to behave in certain situations was really inspiring and freeing to me. And so when I think about this um, hand and balloon, I think about this hand as like, you know, any person or any anything trying to get something, you know, maybe this hand is trying to grab this balloon and this balloon is kind of just quickly escaping, or maybe this hand is trying to let go of this balloon. So it's kind of hard, you know, sometimes when we're making decisions or sometimes, you know, if we experience some trauma even, and we're trying to heal or trying to grow, you know, we have to either learn what to hold on to and what to let go of. And I mean, that, that ideology kind of can be um, you know, applied to any, you know, day-to-day decision-making, um, or relationship, you know, building, or just healing in general, and, uh, so the balloon, to me, kind of represents a goal, or an idea that you're, you know, that you're entangled with, you know, so these strings are just kind of wrapped around the balloons, and sometimes the hands are wrapped around the strings, and they're kind of just in this, like, tango, you know, where, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like being okay with the unknown for me. It's like you don't know what's in that balloon. You don't know what's going to happen when you let go of that balloon. You don't know what's going to happen if you hold on to that balloon. But you know, just being okay with that moment of not knowing for me, and then still moving forward, I think, is like what I'm trying to get at in this work. And so I love the process, and you know. It's it's funny because to me a lot of these a lot of these compositions are kind of sad, and the balloons are like, you know, kind of toying with these hands a little bit, and then I paint them really bright colors and and uh, you know just to kind of further bring back that happiness uh, that I'm trying to get through these tough times and you know focus on the happiness or, or you know focus on the good, um, but that's basically kind of that body of work um what were your other questions <laughs> kind of just how i mean you pretty much answered them like really how it has inspired you how you you informed work you know i really want to talk to you but too being um about public sculpture i know that that's something that you're passionate about and if you could just talk a little bit about that right yeah so when I went back to school, I didn't know what I wanted. I knew I wanted to do sculpture because I love to use my whole body with the work. Um, it's a very physical, it's, you know, the whole process of creating for me is very healing. Um, and so when I, when I was in school, I was at Delta State and there was a shooting on campus. And uh, after this whole experience of being on lockdown for a long time, um, I really felt the need to uh, react. Um, it felt like it was an experience I had never felt and so I created a sculpture in memory of Ethan Schmidt, who was killed. Uh, he was a professor of Native American history, and it was a broken arrow. Um, and it was about 12 feet tall, and it was in downtown Cleveland for a while. And now it's outside of the building where he taught. Um, but just to see the reaction, like his family even calling the sculpture by his name, um, just the experience of like people viewing sculpture, and that just made me realize that public sculpture was what I really enjoyed. And then coming from Indianola, you know, there's not really art anywhere. Like some, a lot of these small towns in Mississippi, the best art is like signage or, you know, uh, things like that, that aren't, you know, that aren't abstract, I guess, enough. Uh, I like, I like to be a little more abstract, but for me, public sculpture is a place where anybody can go, you know, you don't have to be comfortable going to a gallery or museum. You know, everybody's not comfortable to doing that. So um, public sculpture, you can go anytime as you are and experience, you know, whatever you want to experience. <laughs> Was that good? <laughs> good. <laughs> um, also, um, I know that recently I saw, and this is just 
one of those Instagram moments that your local newspaper featured you in an article. Yeah, yeah, that was so cool. Yeah, so they did a write up about me and, and uh, talked about kind of, you know, growing up in Indianola um, and, and my journey to the, to the Invitational, I guess, and, and to creating art. And uh, they talked a little bit about some of the traumas, you know, that I had experienced early on growing up and the resilience, I guess, that, that was shown to, to get to this point. Um, you know, and, and so like when I'm creating, that is my healing time. When I'm, when I'm making things, you know, I can kind of just get out of my head and, and let go of all these things that are bothering me and just kind of hold on to, to what I know is healing. Well, thank you, Lawson. Thank you. So the next theme um, in the show is reckoning. And 2020 was a tumultuous year, as we all know, and really a year of reckoning. So after the murder of George Floyd, there's been a lot of racial reckoning that has called us to really reimagine and reinvent and do things differently. And then of course there's COVID. Um, Brandon, your work, especially um, I Can Hardly See, um, it depicts these human-like figures and it employs really some vivid color to evoke the idea that there is this Ku Klux Klan gathering of members. But then in the middle, you see this black body and it's almost as though it's a protective shield and it casts this light so bright um, that the characters around them don't even seem like a factor. Um, and I just love this work because I thought it conveyed so much power and joy and strength. Um, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that series, but then also um, during COVID, and we talked a lot about your process because at the time, I think when we had our studio visit, you hadn't really even left your house. Um, you were creating works and a lot of your works, of course, reflected that time there and they are featured in the uh, Invitational as well. So can you speak to um, those works that you created during that time and also the work I can hardly see? Hey everybody, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I guess I want to start. I want to start by saying that before COVID, before 2020, my earlier works, especially works like I can hardly see that I did in 2019, they, what I was trying to do was, well, I first of all, I drew a lot of inspiration from artists that came before me, artists who were like still practicing like, like Kara Walker and her like silhouettes and like Michael Ray Charles and his paintings and his sculptures and stuff like that. And what I was trying to do is take that imagery, the imagery that's historically been used to describe people who look like me or disparage people who are like me. And I wanted to turn that around and make it like an image of like strength, of like persevering, like in spite of whatever's going on around you. So here, like, and I can hardly see this man, he's surrounded by these like ghost-like figures, but like the, the smile on his face is so big and his inner light, his inner strength is so bright. He doesn't even care. He can't even like, he can't even see him. He's in his own little world. But then 2020 came around and it kind of forced me to look more inward. And I got a lot more concerned with like inner like emotional states, how I feel personally like within myself in conjunction with like all of the problems that we're facing like, in the world, how like you're feeling like isolated 
and you're feeling self-doubt and you're feeling like stuck and you're still dealing with all of these negative stereotypes, all these disparaging images that are just like coming at you from the news media and from just like day-to-day -day life, but you can't really do anything about it. You just, you just stuck, you just stuck there. Uh, I don't know, what else should I, what else, what else should I say? Well, tell us about your time. And also, um, I thought it was fascinating, the materials that you actually use to, or what you paint on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, like your process? I try to paint on, I like to paint on just whatever, whatever I can get my hands on, whatever can hold some color. Right now I use a lot of cardboard and before, like I can hardly see I did that on cork because I just had, we, I just had a lot of cork board around. And I just do that because like, I don't really think, I don't really think you're supposed, there's not really a way you're supposed to do the art as long as you can get the image that you want, you know? And like cardboard is, is cheap, it's easy to get, it's easy to move around. And like, I'm, I'm a young person. And if you know any young people, you know that we don't have any money. So cardboard is a very convenient and very useful medium for art making. I like, I really like using it because like, I mean, I, I, I like using it because it's cheap but I like using it because it has a lot of like symbolic meaning too. Cause like you use cardboard, you use cardboard for all sorts of things. You, you ship your packages, you pack your moving boxes. If you're standing on the side of a highway and you're hungry, that's what you write your message on. So cardboard is, it's, it's almost like the medium of like the working class or the poor person, because like not a lot of people can go out and get like a hundred dollar canvas, like especially like a three, like a four foot canvas. Not a lot of people can just go out and get, spend a couple hundred dollars on those. But anybody can just rip a piece of cardboard off of the box. So that's what I like to do. Thank you, Brendan, for explaining your process, but also talking about your work. And then lastly, um, is reflection. So, you know, 2020 again, just being a time of loss, loss of time, loss of loved ones. And I love um, Lawson that you mentioned um, Winston Ramsey's uh, work, uh, The Day My Grandmother Became a Widow which is this large scale portrait, um, which is, a, although it's large scale, very intimate um, painting of his grandmother just hours after she lost her husband. So there are, you know, and that work really invokes a sense of time, a time of tragedy and how in those times of tragedy, we're really all the same. And like you said, he's working from these photographs of this Polaroid. And I encourage you all to go see the work, but then, Coulter, your work home, it kind of invites a different type of reflection. Um, it's made entirely from donated fabric and I want you to talk about that, but also this idea of the word home, you know, what home meant to us during this time. You know, for some it's about security, it's about safety, but then the using of these materials and the interconnectedness of this notion of home or sense or self. So um, if you could spend some time just telling us about your process and your work and, you know, the, the work home. Yeah, yeah, well, it's been really great listening to um, Lawson and Brennan talk about their work because themes that occur in their work are also really important in mine. Um, a, a sense of dealing with your situation when things are out of control, when you have no control over what's happening around you, how you can only really control what you do yourself. 
Um, and then in, you know, Brendan's work, when the hyper-personal story, like, sort of emerges in the midst of this broader theme you were talking about, and then accessible materials, like, materials that you can actually afford to use, and that you actually can get your hands on, and I wonder, you know, like, if, if these are themes that just sort of occur in, in art that happens down here in places like Mississippi, you know? Um, so that just as we were talking here just now, I was thinking about how like, the things they talk about are exactly the things that also go into my own work. But um, in terms of that, the piece I have in the show home, um, it's real sort of like typical of the work I do. Uh, it's a little bit atypical in that it's very big. I work in large format because I'm a quilter and everything is like scaled human size. But um, that one's one of my biggest pieces. Um, I use uh, only donated textiles. Every, it's like curtains, bed sheets, t-shirts, whatever anybody wants to leave me. They um, leave it in bags, trash bags at my studio door. Sometimes they don't bother to put it in a trash bag, <laughs> just laying on the sidewalk. Um, they'll mail me stuff, you know, if they're from out of town. And so I take that fabric and um, I make hand sewn quilts out of them. And um, in this particular piece, sorry, my dog's barking. <laughs> in, this, <laughs> in this particular piece, the idea of home is, um, it, it, the idea of like a, having a transient if you need to take home with you. So there's suitcases on one side of the quilt and the other parts of the quilt uh, has like a lamp shade, it has a bedspread, it has an area of a quilt like a tree. Which So the idea is that like, you open the suitcase and you take out this quilt and on the quilt is all the things you need to make a room and a home to live in. And so you have your lamp with the lamp light the bedspread, the wallpaper, the bathroom tile, the curtain, uh, the TV screen, it's all in there. And if you need to leave that place you are, if you gotta go, you can pack your home up in your suitcase in the quilt, fold it up and put it in the suitcase and close it and take it with you to the next place you have to go to. And um, so, you know, using other people's clothes, there's always sort of clues and evidence of what's happened in their lives on their clothes. It's really in a lot of ways like um, an archaeology, like archaeology practice, you know, you can sort of see somebody's, you know, sh work shirt or jeans that are like really, he's like a wiener dog, he's crazy. Work shirt or jeans that's like really, really, really worn or like um, a quilt that's been in a flood. And so you can really tell the experience of people's lives through their clothes. So I try to take their stories and sort of like sew it in together with my own stories. And to me, that sort of makes sort of an all encompassing, like, you know, a view of uh, a, a, a human experience, you know? And I think that especially things of home really um, in relation to domestic craft really sort of like mesh. What I thought was really interesting when we had our studio visit and you were saying when people started at first dropping off materials that you felt like you were, you know, kind of disposing of a lot of this stuff. Like you didn't feel like you had anything good. And then all of a sudden you said that it was just like, oh, wow, I guess the materials are getting better because I'm not disposing yeah. it. But it was really looking at the materials differently. So, yeah. So in the beginning, I um, didn't use very much of it. You know, uh, I was like, only using about 10% of what people brought me. Years down the line, I was like, God, oh, these donations have gotten so much better. I use like everything now, you know? And I just realized it, it wasn't that the, don the donations were exactly the same. It was still old quilts. It was still Walmart t-shirts. It was still like old floral sheets. What had changed was my view of what was valuable. And um, from working with the material, I loved it all. There's, I will use anything you bring me like and it usually like if somebody donates something and I pull it into the studio that day I will almost inevitably use something from that bag on a piece I'm working on right then you know that's how like non-discriminatory I am about the if it's the right color and it's the right texture or whatever and it came in that day I'm, I'm using it and um so yeah the just the process of handling the material and being around the material and the um 
really uh, the the notion that somebody even thought to bring it to me, you know, is has really changed my view of what's important as as an artist and the materials I work with. You know, that notion of them even thinking to to bring it to my door as opposed to throwing it in a trash can to me is all part of like the sort of faded process of getting this material to to wind up in in my work. So I feel like it was sort of meant to be there. Thank you. Well, I know that we are at 1046 and um, wanted to see if we are maybe ready for some questions. Um, thank you all for Coulter, Lawson, Brendan, for sharing with us. Um, I know that, you know, Zoom was not the format that we had planned for. I didn't plan on still being in Houston right now, but I think that this has been a great conversation and um, just wondering, I mean, I guess as we are waiting for maybe some questions or Ryan, if you wanna pop back on. <laughs> oh, just- We have a question. Okay. Um, so our wonderful colleague, um, Professor um, from Millsap, Elise Smith, um, <clears throat> wonders, well, she says, thank you all so much. And such, it's been a really interesting discussion. She's wondering how um, each of you might have been inspired by seeing your fellow artists works in the show. Um, as you think about your future art making, possible subjects, styles, material, audiences, whatever. Can y'all maybe talk through or, um, you know, any kind of inspirations that happen as you walk through the exhibition and how you're thinking about um, work for yourselves in the future? Well, I'll start. I'll go. <laughs> um, I see my work um, headed very quickly toward sculpture. And um, quilts are pretty sculptural anyway, you know, front, backs, middles, several different processes you have to go through that are entirely unrelated to the other processes to make the thing happen and work. They fold, they bend, you wrap them up. So really, really quickly, my um, pieces are probably about to just almost turn entirely sculptural. <laughs> and, you know, calling them quilts will just be sort of a fun exercise, but, um, the piece that I have in the biennial right, I mean, the yeah, the invitational right now is one of my first pieces that really starts to do that. And you can, you can see it in the uh, suitcases and the, the um, sewn drapery where all that's sewn in place and the lampshade and all that sort of stuff and sort of like combining like the painterly elements, the composition with the, you know, the 3D aspect of the quilt. So in terms of like the future of my own work, the piece that's in the show is really one of my first major steps toward what I think is about to be a pretty good like uh, delve into actual sculpture work for me. So I'm excited to see that. <laughs> um, I I thought that the the show was just like really like I said earlier it was just like so inspiring to see so many uh, great artists from Mississippi. And you know who are creating challenging and informed and and unique uh, and personal work, you know, and it, it just is really encouraging because you know you don't have to go somewhere else to to meet you know uh, very creative and talented people to have conversations with you know I think around you know living in a place where there's not many artists we don't get a lot of art talk you know and I think one of my favorite things about going to school was that we talked art every day, you know, and I think that this is just gonna create a bigger network of Mississippi artists who will encourage each other and, and challenge each other and push each other to be better. You don't have to answer, Brendan, but if you have any response, you oh. do so. Oh uh, yeah, I have an answer. Okay. <laughs> so I think, there was, there was an artist, a piece there by an artist named Nathan Petrikowski. 
who put out this screen print animation that I was really struck by. And I really, I never, it never even really occurred to me to display animation in like a fine art setting. So it's really gotten me thinking about how I can integrate more like motion into my like still art. So I'm really excited to see what I can do with that medium. Yeah, I have this like thing in my head for future quilt where I, it's like one of those sculptural pieces where I use shadow casting and um, so that elements of the quilt design are actually cast in shadow on the wall. And um, Carlisle Wolf's cut flowers in that in the show were really, I've seen her work, you know, a lot and she's a friend, but I'd never seen those, you know, the cut steel flowers or whatever in the shadow work that was, uh, I mean, it, that piece really buzzed, you know, with the, the flowers cut out and then the shadows right behind them. And um, so it really got me thinking about my own idea for this thing that I've been like thinking about for a long time. So, yeah. Um, I have a question. I wonder if Coulter, you can just speak a little bit about your um, uh, fellowship and what you intend to do for your fellowship. And I also want to just say, please don't abandon the um, the quilts because I adore them and they're so I never. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just the quilt. It all starts with the quilting. Like the quilting is the base for any sort of exploration and will always be that. But um, yeah, the fellowship, I actually um, want to make this series of quilts and the shadow casting quilt is part of it, um, where you have quilts viewed through several different spectrums and like like spectrums. And so if you view like through 3D or infrared or even shadow casting, you see an inner workings in the quilt that wouldn't necessarily be uh, viewable just by us standing here looking at it with our own eyes. And um, I know that there's a travel element to the, um, to the fellowship and I need to figure out <laughs> where I'm going. And um, I'm excited to do that. And um, you know, when, when you work in like, you know, the Amer American quilt making, and uh, you live in the Southeast, you know, you're kind of in a, you're kind of there already, you know? And so I'm real lucky in that my sort of specialty that, that I'm, I'm, I'm from where that really, you know, exists with a real strong tradition. Of course, there's other American quilt making traditions in all sorts of other places. And um, maybe I'll go there. But um, right now my plans for the um, fellowship have to do with actual making pieces of work that I've got planned out and you know so when I read about um, what you're intending to do for the fellowship I just think about um, the artist Hank Willis Thomas and he's a photographer and does a myriad of other things but he has a series of works um, where it is activated by light and from a camera right so you essentially when you come up on the on the um, photograph, um, you can't see what is actually intended until the light from the camera or you like snap a, fo a photograph with your phone and then the whole of, um, work um, illuminates and it's really fascinating. So could be, you know, in terms of technique, I, gr I think the funds are, it's so wonderful just to be able to like talk <laughs> and expand, you know? Yeah. Um, I have a question in the chat. Um, as artists from Mississippi, do you feel like you need more, um, more of, oh, what do you feel like you need more of to create your work, more space to show your work, more fun, support, et cetera? How can we make Mississippi a better place for artists? This is the time to advocate for yourself, so say it all. <laughs> I mean, I think we need all of those things. Um, you know, I think we need more, more shows. I think we need more uh, people who go to those shows. Um, I think we need more conversations and pulling art to the forefront. Um, you know, when I was up in Detroit, it was so cool because I would go to, I would have to choose, you know, of all the 15 gallery openings that weekend, 
which ones I would go to, you know, and they were all just, there was always people there and that was just so cool. And I think like Mississippi, there's so many artists here and there's so many pockets and, you know, we're all used to driving. So, you know, I think we should support each other more, you know, when Jackson artists have a show, you know, people from the Delta should go down. Or when artists from the Delta have a show, you know, I'd love to see Jackson folks up there. Um, so, you know, I just think like more connecting, obviously more funds. Funds always help, <laughs> but uh, you know, connecting and, and supporting, I think that's really important. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, I do, I do think being more connected, like as an artistic community is important. And like, I know like a lot of cities have things like art walks and things like that, but Mississippi is very like, mm -hmm. spread out. A lot of we can't there's not really a lot of occasion to just walk from venue to venue and see different art shows so to have more spaces to show work that show artistic work like regularly that would be a great thing yeah and you know like you think about mississippi and it's like you know writing we nailed it music nailed it you know visual arts, you know, thank y'all for coming to this panel and showing up, you know, like all of you guests who logged in, like, you know, if this was the Faulkner conference, you know, it would, you know, so I mean, like, I really like think that it takes an effort, visual arts just, it needs to be important enough to people. And I think that that comes with shows like this. I think it comes with education. I think it comes with like more events and definitely funds, you know, like, buy the work from the artist, let them live and, you know, make a living doing it. But, you know, we're, we're preaching to the choir here because we already all know this already, um, that this whole audience, it's, you know, I don't know, I guess more events and just putting into the newspaper, talking about it, you know, um, will make, maybe make like the broader Mississippi audience, um, you know, that's a great question, by the way, I think that's really good. But, um, but, you know, music and literature has managed to do it. So I think that visual arts can do it as well here. Um, are there any more questions that our audience wants to ask? We have room for our time for one more. Walter, what's your dog's name? <laughs> he's Oscar. His name's Oscar. He's a little wiener dog. And he's very much enjoyed being a participant on this Zoom panel. <laughs> I enjoyed what he had to say. Yeah. Every time somebody walks down the street, I have to mute, mute my microphone. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, hold on. One more question. Um, how can we as artists help create spaces for work and share being an artist and be open to the public too? Uh, well, you know what, one thing about Mississippi is that um, you can get a big space, you can rent a big space for not a lot of money, you know? You can get some people together and even if you just rent it temporarily, you know? Um, I mean, you, it, in, in some of these small towns, you can really get like a large area to work in or have a show. So even like pop-up type stuff, you know, um, is doable here. That would not be possible in a big city. I've tried some pop-up shows and they worked in big cities, but it was so expensive and it took like a whole bunch of people to get together. You know, the good thing about sort of small town rural life is there's nobody there to tell you no, nobody there to tell you that's the wrong way. We don't do art like that here because they don't do it at all really. So you, you know, it's sort of like open to, you know, you can really experiment. There's a lot of freedom. And because, um, you know, renting a building downtown somewhere might not be that expensive, especially with a group of people, there is a lot of possibility to sort of really do it yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's a real, that's really uh, an advantage to be in, in a place like this, um, that right there. 
I missed a question and I apologize because I was looking at a different screen uh, for questions, but then there's one that I missed. So um, the self-taught Louisiana artist Clementine Hunter used paper sometimes for her quilts. Do you ever use materials, this is for you Coulter, do you ever use materials other than cloth um, of various sorts? And then I guess the follow-up is, are you aware of G G's Benz quilters? You all might want to visit them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, G's Ben Quilters are, of course, incredible. Very, very, very famous. And um, um, yeah, so it, everyone, you know, very much admire their work. And they were uh, real leaders and still are real leaders. And for other quilters and our work, work like mine would never have been accepted as quilt work if it weren't for the work that the G's Ben women did. But um, yeah, I do use uh, all sorts of materials, you know, like if somebody, like just the piece in the Invitational right now, somebody donated a bunch of fabric to me in those suitcases. So not only did I use the fabric, I also used the suitcases that she donated. And, um, you know, like cardboard, I use a lot of cardboard posters. Um, you know, when people donate fabric to me, there's often stuff tucked in the pockets, like school pictures, um, notes, grocery list, you know, all that sort of stuff will make it into the work as well. So you really should check your pockets before you donate stuff to me because I will put it in the piece and you might not want it there. But yeah, well, I've had some love notes and stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, Danielle, do you have any closing words before I go through my post-event spiel? I just want to thank everyone again. I mean, this has been a wonderful process, and um, I just am excited even for curators to learn about you all. I mean, and it takes platforms like this to bring people in and, you know, so I can spread the word. I mean, I definitely we'll see all of you guys in Houston at some point. So, you know, we'll just have to have a dialogue back and forth. I think Ryan and I've had conversations about this before, just about the South and all of the regional artists, um, talented regional artists in the South and really focusing on um, helping that along. So um, I look forward to working with you all again. And again, Ryan, thank you for this opportunity. You know, again, I love you to death. And it was great working with you and hope we can do something like this soon again. Of course. Thank you. Um, thank you, Danielle. And thank you to Brendan and Coulter and Lawson. I mean, again, congratulations um, on your work and the exhibition. And I mean, I just look forward to um, having people come to the museum, please tell your friends, the cousin down the street, all the people. Um, I think our marketing team has done a really wonderful job at and, you know, sending materials for you all to share and spread the word. So please advocate for yourself and advocate for others and advocate for the museum. Um, if you all in the audience enjoyed this um, event today, please get tickets to see the exhibition, which is on view opens today um, until November 7th. <clears throat> we obviously want to thank our members for helping us produce programs like this one and for supporting the museum. If you'd like to become a member, please find more information on our website. Um, other ways to engage with this exhibition, we have an app that you all can download um, on your phone or log on through the computer. We are on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I guess upcoming, upcoming, program, upcoming programs include AT&T Presents Makers in Their Spaces with Rob Cooper um, on August 21st <clears throat> and on Instagram Live on August 23rd. Um, again, stay connected via our IG Facebook newsletter. So many ways to engage and we just look forward to staying connected um, I bid you all adieu. I hope you all have a beautiful Saturday and hopefully we'll see some artists in the galleries this, um, this afternoon. So have a wonderful day. Thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you. It's great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.